Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Sorrell and I'm the Executive Director of the UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you'd like to ask a question during today's session, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Next slide. Next slide, please. Our first speaker today is Dr. Carrie Consall. Dr. Consall is a board certified UCI Health surgical oncologist who specializes in diagnosing and treating breast cancer and benign breast diseases. She is highly skilled in nipple sparing mastectomy and minimally invasive hidden scar breast surgery. She is an associate professor and breast surgery section chief in the UCI School of Medicine Department of Surgery. Her clinical interests include caring for patients with breast cancer, specifically young women and pregnancy-related breast cancer, as well as patients at higher risk for developing breast malignancies. She also works collaboratively with our integrative health services providers. Her research interests include surgical outcomes in breast cancer patients, as well as surgical education. She has published several research papers and book chapters in her field. I'll now turn it over to the esteemed Dr. Kinsall. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I thought today I could talk a little bit about breast cancer risk mitigation, as well as some recent surgical advancements that we've made in the field over the last few years. Next slide, please. So as we start talking about breast cancers and um, my talk that we'll get into, I just wanna take one quick step back and talk a little bit about our UCI um, Women's Cancer Initiative. Um, the reason I'm here today is to talk about the women breast and reproductive cancers. Um, we're also building upon the success of our current programs as we've had these programs in place for a little while now, um, but as we become more, um, more and more established with more sites to see patients um, and increasing our clinical trials, we are um, seeing great success within our patients. So in all facets here, you get a team-based approach with an emphasis on education of our patients, early detection of cancers, which then parlays into an improved survival, as well as prevention of cancer, and while offering all of the advanced, uh, the most advanced treatment options. Next slide, please. So our Women's Cancer and Health Initiative includes these four sections. It's a comprehensive breast care program, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. We have a hereditary cancer genetics program, a women's cancer clinical trial and research program, which is quite robust, and a comprehensive gynecologic cancer program. Next slide. So to jump into my talk, let's talk about the facts of breast cancer, which many people don't know. Today, one in eight and almost one in seven women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. This number sounds very overwhelming, but what's very interesting about it is 85% of those women have no family history of breast cancer at all. So many times in my clinic, I have patients come in to see me who say, oh, I'm fine. There's no way I could have breast cancer because no one in my family has had it. Well, those people are actually the minority of patients who do get breast cancer diagnosis. We've gotten very, very good at treating breast cancer, and we'll talk a little bit more about screening in a moment, but now at least 93% of patients who are diagnosed with an early stage breast cancer survive past five years. In recent years, this number has gotten as close as 97% for some breast cancers, which is just unbelievable. Another scary fact, almost 300,000 women and about 2,350 men in the U.S. will be diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer specifically this year. You can see from that number, about 99% of breast cancers are in women, but 1% are in men. So it's something that we need to pay attention to. And unfortunately, our treatment has gotten much better, but breast cancer remains the leading cause of cancer death in women, second only to lung cancer. Next slide, please. So when we talk about breast cancer, there's got to be some risk stratification. And who are the women who are at increased risk? Well, women is the first one there. As I just told you, 99% of breast cancers do present in women. Women over the age of 50 have an increased risk of breast cancer. As we age, that risk slowly goes up ever so slightly every year. 
there was an interesting study done in um, Scandinavia many years ago who looked at women in their 90s at um, the time of death. And at autopsy, they found almost all of those women had breast cancer, which had not been diagnosed while they were living. So this shows us that eventually something will happen if we all live long enough. The question is, when is it important to treat it and when does it not matter anymore? If you have a close relative who's been diagnosed with breast cancer before 45 or anyone in your family with ovarian cancer, you're at increased risk for breast cancer. If you have a genetic mutation that leads to that risk, everyone has heard about the BRCA1 and 2 genes, but we have many genes now that we know with a mutation can increase your risk of breast cancer. Patients who have an Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, also at increased risk. Something that people ask me about all the time is what about estrogen? We hear estrogen can put us at an increased risk and it does. Estrogen stimulates our breast tissue. When our breast tissue is stimulating, it can cause these cells to divide. And every time a cell divides in our body, it has the opportunity to divide incorrectly. Typically our immune system can catch those and kill those abnormal cells. But when they're allowed to divide abnormally and to continue to divide, that's what cancer really is. So every month with our menstrual cycle, we have a surge of estrogen that can affect our breast tissue. Also patients who take exogenous hormones, meaning a combination of estrogen and progesterone also have a slightly increased risk of breast cancer. Patients who have a history of breast cancer or abnormal cells on biopsy are going to be at a higher risk. Those who have dense breast tissue on mammogram, they're also at a higher risk. This is something I should just stop and talk about for one moment. It's important to understand that 50% of women, half of the population is born with and has dense breast tissue. The other half do not. And the reason we can tell it's dense is because when we do a mammogram, we can see it. It looks more white compared to a more fatty replaced breast. So it's a little harder to find a breast cancer with dense tissue, but also that risk of breast cancer is slightly higher in this half of the population. And the thought behind that is that there's just more glandular tissue. There's more cells that have the potential to become a breast cancer in those with dense breast tissue. And lastly, a small percentage of the population, but those patients who had radiation therapy to their chest or breast when they were children also have an increased lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. Next slide. So you can see a lot of those that we just talked about are not modifiable. They're just who you are. It's either your genetic, genetic makeup, um, when you started your period, so on and so forth. But we do have many modifiable risk factors that we can um, use to decrease our risk of getting breast cancer. You can see them listed here, but it's really important for people to be physically active. Some recent studies have come out that show in breast cancer survivors, those who are exercising five days a week drop their risk in as much as 50% of getting another breast cancer, which is amazing. Patients who are overweight or obese, they have a higher risk of getting breast cancer because in our fat cells, we also make estrogen, therefore stimulating the breast tissue. So by losing that extra weight can decrease the risk. We already discussed exogenous hormones. That means hormones that you take as a pill or otherwise. Interestingly, having a pregnancy, first pregnancy after the age of 30 increases your risk of breast cancer those who have never had a pregnancy, and those who did not breastfeed, all of these things can slightly increase that risk. All of this goes back to the idea of that estrogen stimulation once again. And so when we can take a break in that cyclical estrogen stimulation, it helps decrease our risk of breast cancer. Interestingly, all patients always ask me, what food should I not eat? What should I do if my diet to decrease my risk? The two most important things that we can do to modify are no smoking. Smoking increases your risk of breast cancer along with many other, obviously, and alcohol intake. We know that patients who drink four or more alcoholic beverages a week have an increased risk of breast cancer. And this is newer to us over the last few years. There's no data to suggest that women who drink a lot of milk, who eat a lot of tofu or soy products have an increased risk of breast cancer. The only other food that we know can increase that risk is nitrates such as cured meats. So if you ate a lot of pepperoni, it could possibly increase your risk, but that's like eating a massive charcuterie board every single day of these cured meats. And so it's pretty rare that that would cause a problem. Next slide, please. So I touched on this in an earlier slide, but there's um, 
when we do mammograms, there's things that our radiologists are looking for that look abnormal. One of those things is calcifications or calcium deposits in the breast. When they biopsy these, what the radiologist typically is looking for is a very early stage breast cancer or possibly abnormal cells. So when the biopsy comes back, if a patient is found not to have breast cancer, but they're found to have some atypical or abnormal cells on their biopsy, this puts them at a higher risk for one day of getting a breast cancer. It can put them at as a high of a risk as 30% in a lifetime of getting breast cancer because we know the breast is making some abnormal cells. So some of the, the names of these things are atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and lobular carcinoma in situ. So when a patient has a diagnosis of one of these, the first step normally is to go in and excise that area of the breast and just make sure there's no cancer nearby. But if there's not, we have our patients talk with the medical oncologist to talk about something called chemo prevention. Now chemo I know sounds very scary to many patients, but all it means is this is medication to prevent breast cancer. And this medication works by, you've got it, decreasing estrogen in the breast. And so when you take these pills, you may have heard of some of them like tamoxifen or these a whole group of drugs called aromatase inhibitors. They've been around for decades, they're very safe. It can decrease the risk of breast cancer by 50%. So we currently have a trial, which is a web-based decision support um, intervention for our patients who are considering taking these medicines or not. And this has been really helpful to help educate our patients to make the right decision for themselves moving forward to reduce their risk in this specific setting. Next slide, please. So in line with this, we've also created at UCI a high-risk breast cancer clinic. Many of the patients, as you could see from the first couple of slides, are at increased risk of breast cancer. And so we want to aid the primary care doctors and our patients to make sure they're getting the care that they need in terms of their screening and their prevention. So what we have in place is for any of the patients who qualify, which would be, by the way, a high risk is considered an over 20% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. Remember, the average woman is about 12 to 15%. So when we have these patients who come in and see us, we put into place high-risk screening protocol, protocols, which typically include an annual mammogram, just like you're likely already getting, followed by an annual breast MRI. We like to split these by six months. So we're looking at your breast tissue twice a year and in different ways to find breast cancer as early as we can in this special patient population. We also set up visits with breast surgical oncologists like myself to organize their risk reduction as well as do an annual breast exam. We refer to a medical oncologist who's also in our clinic to discuss those medications we've been talking about. We have you meet with a genetic counselor to talk about your family risk and to see if you would qualify for genetic testing. We have partnered with the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute for an integrative approach to breast wellness. And I'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. And we also keep our patients educated on the newest research and clinical trials because educating yourselves is the most important thing that you can do to reduce your risk. Next slide, please. So I just wanna turn gear a little bit here here and talk about some surgical advancements that have happened over the last about five years. So if you look at this picture first on your screen, you can see a breast, a cartoon of one. There's a little white kind of oval in there that's, that's um, picturing the lesion that needs to be removed. And then there's a wire that's been placed into the breast. So many times when we go to the operating room to remove things in the breast, we cannot feel them. And we've only found them on imaging because our imaging is getting better and better and better. Well, we need as a surgeon, a way to find it in the breast. Cause most of the time, like I said, we can't see or feel it once we get in there. So historically the radiologist would help us on the day of surgery and literally put a wire into the patient's breast before they came to the operating room. This was fraught with a lot of problems. It can be uncomfortable. Many patients would actually pass out when they had this done. Um, it could, um, it was very stressful. The timing was hard, already a long day for surgery, and then having to do this on top of it was a lot for the patients. But now, if you advance to the next picture, please, instead of the wire, we have something called a savvy scalp that we place into the area of the breast that needs to be removed. These are once again for lesions that we can't feel, and the radiologist can place this at any time prior to surgery, even months ahead of time. So it really decouples that localization from the operation, which patients love. 
The other great thing is there's no wire that can get pulled out. It's less uncomfortable. You can imagine all the benefits from it. So when you come to the operating room, we have a special probe that uses radio frequency to locate and then I can remove the area of concern. So it literally beeps at me and tells me how many millimeters I am away from the area that needs to be removed. So it's very precise and therefore we take out less breast tissue and have better cosmetic outcomes. If you can advance to the next picture. This is an X-ray of a piece of breast tissue that we removed in the operating room. You can see right in the center, there's a tiny little white clip. That's that microbiopsy clip that the radiologist place in the breast at the time of all biopsies. And then just superior and to the right of that, you can see a thicker portion with two antenna. That is the savvy scout. So the radiologist puts it next to the clip and therefore we know exactly what to remove. UC Irvine at Pacific Breast Care was the first completely wireless center in all of Orange County. So we're the leaders in this field and it's been fantastic for our patients. Next slide, please. So this is one of the patients you can see on her right breast, likely your screen left. She had recently had a lumpectomy to remove her surge or to remove her cancer. There's a slight change you can see to the around her areola. Um, but this over the next couple of weeks was completely gone where you couldn't even tell she had had surgery. Next picture, please. And this is the thing that we had just talked about, but this is what was removed from her breast. She was thrilled at the end of the day. Next slide, please. But for those patients that we still need to do a mastectomy for, which there are many, many different reasons why, there's lots of different mastectomies that we can do. And mastectomy just means removal of the breast tissue. One is a simple mastectomy where we remove a decent amount of the skin, including the nipple and areola, and the goal is to have a flat chest on that side. These are for patients who do not want a reconstruction. We can also do what we call a skin sparing mastectomy and a nipple sparing mastectomy. So in this picture, this patient had just finished her surgery and was about to go home. You can actually see her bandage and her arm from her IV. In her left breast, she had had a nipple sparing mastectomy with a direct to implant reconstruction. So when she got home, you know, she still had all of her breast and cosmetically felt very intact and very good. And so this nipple sparing mastectomy has really changed the game for women who do need to have a mastectomy. Next slide, please. And you can see in this picture is a little bit different. So this patient had what we call a skin sparing mastectomy. So the nipple and the areola has been removed, but the rest of her skin has been left behind. This reconstruction is different than the last picture. The last was an implant. This one is called autologous or using her own tissue from her abdomen. So the reconstructive surgeons basically do like a tummy tuck, take that fatty tissue from the abdomen, move it up to the chest, hook up the blood vessels to the blood vessels behind the sternum and create new breast. So you can see with autologous reconstructions, they look so natural. They age with a patient just like a breast would. And then once we tattoo nipples on or create new nipples, you can hardly tell that this is not a natural breast. Next slide, please. Another great thing that we've made huge strides in is something called lymphatic surgery. As many of you know, um, after we remove lymph nodes for cancer surgery, patients can get something called lymphedema, and this is permanent arm swelling that can occur. This can be really hard for patients. In these three pictures, each of them has left arm lymphedema, and you can see the different stages of lymphedema. It can be very painful. It can be cosmetically um, not what patients would like, and it's a higher risk for these patients to get infections of their arms. So now at the time of lymph node removal, when we need to remove more than just a couple lymph nodes due to cancer in the lymph nodes, we have our reconstructive surgeons join us and do something called a lymphovenous bypass. They basically hook up all those draining lymphatics that we've disrupted by removing the lymph nodes and they let them drain again into our veins. Therefore that fluid has a way to get out of the arm. So we're really preventing the vast majority of lymphedema. For our patients who already have lymphedema who come in to see us, there are surgeries now that they can do to help treat this, which has never been done before. They can actually take lymph nodes from a different part of the body and move them to that area to decrease that. So this is really exciting and something that's changing everything. Next slide, please. So just to touch a little bit on why UCI Health Pacific Breast Care is unique. Next slide. We've already talked a little bit about the Savvy Scout on the bottom in the high-risk cancer clinic. We also do something called same-day reads. So our radiologist who's there 
Um, when you come in for a screening mammogram there, he always gives you the results that same day. I'm sure most of you have had the experience where you get the uh, screening mammogram and then you have to wait weeks to get a letter in the mail. And if you need more imaging, you have to come back in and make another appointment. We try to get everything done same day, if not within that same week. So it's really decreased anxiety and stress. There's three things I do wanna to touch on. The chemo cooling cap program, the clinical trials, and the integrative wellness. Hi, Dr. Tawari. Hello. I'll be done in just one minute and we'll have okay. you in. Great. Is that okay. Yeah, yeah, take your time. Okay, great. Next slide. Dr. Tawari is in the operating room today, so he's able to, to, to join us. This is great. So, quickly, the chemo cap program is something that we have at the Pacific Breast Care Center. And one of the biggest concerns for many of our breast cancer patients is the loss of their hair that's um, induced by chemotherapy. So you can see a picture of it. It's a little funny looking, this cap that we can um, offer to patients. It looks almost like an old football helmet. Um, and this cooling, this uh, process is that the cap is constantly cooled with very, very, very cold water. Therefore, it constricts the blood vessels in the scalp and therefore the hair is not getting the chemotherapy. So many of our patients are able to maintain their hair even through chemotherapy, which has been fantastic. We offer this at no cost to our patients because this has been funded by a philanthropic gift to this to our Newport Center. Next slide, please. We have many clinical trials, maybe even just over 30 clinical trials at this time just for breast cancer. By offering patients these clinical trials, it has um, changed the outcomes and has moved the science along. So we're able to de-escalate many times surgery that we do and therefore the complications from breast cancer treatment. Next section or next slide, please. And lastly, something that's near and dear to my heart, we started a few years ago here is called the Integrated Breast Wellness Clinic. We have a comprehensive whole person approach to breast health for individuals with all sorts of different breast um, symptoms and concerns, as you can see listed here. Many of our patients who have had cancer also, we loop them into this program once they're done with their acute treatment. You can see on this slide all of the different um, contributing factors that we have to different breast disease. And so our integrated medicine doctors are able to do a very complex and complete history and physical to look at other things that may be affecting your breast health. So we work hand in hand, even in the same clinic, to be doing all of the, the newest and the greatest with screening and surgery and so on and so forth, but also taking a holistic approach to our patients. One thing I'm very excited about is we're starting a clinical trial soon, looking at using acupuncture on the day of surgery for our breast cancer patients, which I think is going to really help decrease the need for um, as much anesthesia and pain medicine on the day of surgery. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Consal. Uh, we will have a Q&A session following um, our presentation of our second speaker, Dr. Krish Tawari. Dr. Tawari is a board-certified gynecologic surgeon and chief of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the UCI School of Medicine. His clinical interests include women's health, cancer vaccines, and drug discovery for the treatment of gynecologic cancers. His clinical expertise allows him to perform a full array of operative procedures, including advanced da Vinci robotic surgery, complex laparoscopic surgery, radical pelvic operations, and intestinal, urological, and fertility preserving procedures. Dr. Tawari is the principal investigator for the gynecologic oncology's team's first randomized trial of anti-angiogenesis drugs for cervical cancer. He is also conducting several ovarian cancer clinical trials at the UCI Health Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Tawari's research study in advanced cervical cancer was published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year, and he holds numerous awards for excellence in his field. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Tawari. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank yeah. you so much. For some reason, I'm not able to start my video. Every time it says it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Okay. We will try and take care of that. Okay. But I'm going to jump right into this. Um, yeah. Great. 
I'm really excited um, to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, love the previous presentation, especially with the cold cap to prevent hair loss. Uh, we've used that on several of our patients and it's so nice to hear that that was um, donated to the university because insurance um, does not uh, insurance does not cover that. And so it's really nice that we have that option for our patients. So I'm going to talk about gynecologic cancer. Um, I've been participating in the um, anti-cancer challenge for um, since it was uh, initiated here at UC Irvine several years ago. And so we're looking forward to another great anti-cancer challenge program later this year. But I'm going to um, jump right in. Um, now, do I have control of my slides? Uh, next slide, please. So. When I think about oncology and I think about my career here at UCI, I've been here um, forever, medical school, residency, fellowship, and uh, faculty. And it's because the institution has so much to offer. And as an oncologist, it's not just about doing an operation or giving chemotherapy or doing radiation. Um, there's a whole host of things that have to come together to converge, if you will, to help our patients do well. And only here at this institution have I been able to do everything that I need to do to make sure patients um, do well. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And it looks like, yeah, my video's on now. Um, sorry, I'm not in my suit. I um, We got kind of delayed in surgery this morning. Uh, surgery took a little longer than expected, so I didn't have time to switch out. Um, but. I want you to uh, follow my slides to begin with. So let's first talk about the discipline of what I refer to as gynecologic oncology. Gynecologic oncology, we can go to the next slide, was a, um, is a relatively new subspecialty. Dr. Phil Desai, who was chair of our department here at UC Irvine and director of the division of gynecologic oncology, had his entire professional career at UC Irvine from 76 to 2018 when he unfortunately passed away. He um, was what we would call the first official gynecologic oncology trainee. Um, he finished his service with the US Navy in the 60s and he won a um, award from the American Cancer Society and that funded his further training in gynecologic cancer surgery at the MD Anderson Hospital and Tumor Institute. But then when he finished and he came to UC Irvine in 1976, he wanted to create a formal training program to help teach um, people who had finished residency in OBGYN how to perform complex cancer operations and administer chemotherapy to women struggling with gynecologic cancer. So we really owe a great depth of gratitude to Phil Desai. And I was um, recently granted by um, Rob Bristow, our chairman, the Dean Stamos and our chancellor, the Philip J, D J. Desai Endowed Chair. So that's a very important thing that will help fund um, additional research that I'm interested in. We can go to the next slide. So moving down the wheel, um, surgical innovation is a very important thing. It's so important that our patients do well with surgery and that they recover from surgery. And therefore, advances in surgery have been made to not only allow us to do more precise and careful cancer operations, but to help our patients do better postoperatively. We can go to the next slide and we'll talk about surgical innovation. For example, robotic surgery for endometrial cancer. UC Irvine spearheaded this um, technique. Back in 2007, the FDA only approved um, the da Vinci robot for hysterectomy in 2006, but we were the leaders in bringing this um, machine to help patients um, have hysterectomies for actual cancer. And with the da Vinci robot, we're able to do the surgery through very tiny um, holes that are about eight millimeters in size. And we're able to do the entire operation, um, something that when I was trained in the 1990s to do, we had to do that operation with a big, large incision. Uh, next slide. Another um, fantastic thing about innovative surgery is helping um, reduce side effects. Historically, we used to have to remove a lot of lymph nodes to look for any cancer, but sometimes patients could end up with limb swelling, swelling of the legs. Women undergoing breast cancer surgery could have ended up with a swollen arm from having too many lymph nodes removed. But with sentinel lymphatic mapping, which was first studied in breast cancer and, and in melanoma, we've adopted that over into our treatment 
for women with endometrial cancer. So now we only have to take one lymph node out, um, which represents the very first lymph node the cancer would have metastasized to. And through the innovative technology of using this fluorescent green dye, you can see we're able to identify which lymph node that is. What is the first lymph node? Because if the first lymph node is clean, then you don't have to get rid of all, take all the other lymph nodes and put the patient at risk for leg swelling. Let's go to the next slide. Heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. This is another um, surgical innovation where for women with advanced ovarian cancer, we actually put chemotherapy directly into the abdomen after we've removed all the cancer and we heat the chemotherapy before we administer it because it is, we've been shown through studies that were done here at UC Irvine by my colleague, Dr. Randall, who is now um, on the East Coast, that heated chemotherapy makes the chemotherapy work better against the cancer. Next slide. We also do fertility preserving surgery. Again, when I trained, I'm not trying to say that I'm old, but I feel dated, but for women with very small cervical cancers, we used to have to perform a complete radical hysterectomy and the patient would never have been able to have children again. And what was more concerning is many of these women that have cervical cancer are young and they have not had children. Now we've been able to learn how to perform fertility preserving surgery by just removing the cancerous cervix and reconnecting the uterus to the, the back of the vagina. And these uteruses work fine and patients are able to have um, children. You go to the next slide, I'll show you two um, great examples. Both of these patients are my patients that I took care of and they um, both had fertility preserving surgery and they've both given me permission to share their stories. Um, on the left is, uh, she's a captain in the US Air Force. She's also an ICU nurse. And she um, was the first person I performed this um, fertility preserving surgery. And this was a photograph taken last year of her son and he's now taller than her, he's 14. And on the right side um, is another one of my patients. Um, same situation, she was young, she did not had kids, um, really wanted to have a child of her own um, after she got married. Uh, but we were able to perform a fertility preserving surgery. And then we got this great Christmas gift um, in the clinic uh, last December when she came by to show us the baby she had after having survived cancer treatment. Next slide. So moving around my wheel. So we talked about the discipline and the, the um, department Dr. Desai built. We talked about these different areas of surgical innovation. Let's talk about science. Science is what moves our field forward, especially when we're thinking about treatment and new medicines to help patients with. Let's go to the next slide. So translational science, the difference between basic science was what, what you hear about happening in universities and translational science, which is at the hospital, it's taking science from the workbench, the laboratory bench and translating it so that it has a benefit to the patient at the patient's bedside. So from the bench, from the laboratory bench to the patient bedside, that's the term, that's what translational science means. And the Queen of Hearts Laboratory is this amazing um, laboratory that was gifted to us by the Queen of Hearts Foundation. They're a nonprofit organization that raises money for ovarian cancer research and they've partnered with UC Irvine. These are the three um, sisters whose mom unfortunately passed away from ovarian cancer many years ago. Her name was Ann Doby. And in honor of their mother, these three sisters have created the Queen of Hearts Foundation. And here we are at the ribbon cutting ceremony um, for their lab. Um, and that laboratory is at UC Irvine on the main campus in Irvine. Next slide. Another important, um, important thing when we're thinking about uh, translational science is um, Bo Biden's son, um, or President Biden's son, Bo, unfortunately died of glioblastoma. And so while he was still vice president, he announced a cancer moonshot, um, which was to take applications for innovative translational science and award grants. And we um, received one of the four moonshots that um, have been awarded thus far for um, cancer treatment. This is an award I got for um, studying um, specimens, uh, cervical cancer specimens, and it's a three and a half million dollar award um, to help us identify proteins in um, a cervical cancer tumor that may be able to help us develop better medicines for patients who need it. Next slide. 
Um, let's look at our clinical trials platform. I was delighted to hear in the breast cancer world, um, you guys, they have 29 clinical trials and clinical trials is really how we move the science forward. You know, surgical innovation is important because it helps each individual patient um, do uh, recover better from surgery, but clinical trials helps us cure patients. So let's look at some of the clinical trials we've opened here at UC Irvine. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so one of the drugs we were uh, studying is the anti-BEGF um, uh, molecule. Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Is the anti is a monoclonal? This is an antibody that prevents tumors from sprouting blood vessels. Now we know that this process called angiogenesis is a process that allows tumors to nourish themselves by forming blood vessel connections to the patient. We studied a medicine that stops the cancer from being able to do this. Next slide, please. And this is um, a uh, just a slide showing I ran this trial about nine years ago at UC Irvine, and we published this in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this trial showed a survival benefit with this medicine, and this resulted not only in US FDA approval of the drug, but it resulted in at least 60 additional countries approving the drug based on this study that originated at UC Irvine. Next slide. Um, PARP inhibitors are a medicine that is great um, and has shown um, to help women with advanced ovarian cancer. We'll go to the next slide. Um, immunotherapy, you've heard of um, immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is also um, shown to help women with uh, gynecologic cancer, specifically endometrial cancers and cervical cancers. Next slide. This is a study I published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year, again, showing a survival benefit of immunotherapy for cervical cancer. The um, New England Journal of Medicine is the highest rated journal, medical journal in the, in the world. And so it was a big honor for us at UC Irvine to publish these papers in that journal. Next slide. Uh, we have other medicines we're studying. Antibody drug conjugates are um, like Trojan horses. They have a molecule that targets the cancer specifically, but attached to the molecule is a drug that will cause the cancer to die whenever the molecule attaches to the cancer. And we're um, leading the way with this, with the trial studying that as well. Next slide. Um, and we're uh, among the lead um, investigators at UC Irvine for what is probably going to end up being the very first gene therapy for ovarian cancer. And we expect the results of this study to be released um, very shortly, hopefully before the year's over. Next slide. And then there's some other uh, very novel medicines we're studying. Um, and that's this is just a, a, a cartoon showing uh, one of the things. And this all happens through understanding translational science. Next slide. So moving down the wheel, let's talk to, we've done the discipline, we've done surgical innovation, translational science, clinical trials. Now let's talk about community prevention because prevention of cancer is always much more important than treatment, right? You'd rather prevent the cancer before it even happens. Next slide. So Anne's clinic, we mentioned Anne is the, um, in whom the Queen of Hearts Foundation was named after. Anne's Clinic is a high risk clinic at UC Irvine. We also have an office at our Laguna Hills office where we take women at high risk for gynecologic cancers and breast cancer and colon cancer. Patients at risk for these cancers, um, mainly ovarian cancer, but all these other cancers that are hereditary, we screen them and, make, and monitor them and do their genetic testing and advise them accordingly. Next slide. Um, we want to have a national voice in our department. We don't want to be isolated from the rest of the world, even though we do wonderful things at UC Irvine. We are full, very well connected with the outside community. Next slide. You can see um, one of our former trainees, Diane Yamada, was the president of our National Society of Gynecologic Oncology. Another fellow of ours, Dr. Wendy Brewster, um, is the upcoming president of the National of the Society of G1 Oncology, and UC Irvine has had other trainees um, become presidents of this society. Next slide. We have a voice with the National Institutes of Health through a lot of our grants that we um, get. Next slide. We have a corridor directly to the National Cancer Institute through our clinical trials program. Next slide. 
And in terms of the US FDA, I can't think of another um, department in the state of California that has had more um, drugs approved to help patients struggling with gyne female cancers than our program here at UC Irvine. Next slide. Let's talk about global health really quickly. Next slide. So we've been going to Tanzania for about seven or eight years. We, it, was, um, it was derailed due to COVID, but um, we bring medical students and residents and fellows with us and we screen women for cervical cancer. Tanzania has the lowest doctor to patient ratio in the world, one to 50,000. And our um, trips there that happen every year are probably the only time the women in Tanzania um, have an opportunity to get screened for cervical cancer in their entire lives. Next slide. And this is um, pictures from the clinic and I was given permission to share these. Uh, cervical cancer is a very serious disease. It kills 250,000 people worldwide. And in the poorer parts of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are here, Southeast Asia, including India and Latin America, the disease is rampant because they don't have pap smears, they don't have vaccines. So they take it seriously. And in one week, we would screen 900 women um, when we're there in Tanzania. Next slide. And then finally, medical education. That's a very key um, component of our my wheel of oncology. And you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and this is um, these are the five. This is me on the left, sitting with my four counterparts, the division directors at UC Davis, UC San Francisco, UC San Diego, and UCLA. And then you can see our alumni training program uh, photograph from last year. We, most of our trainees that have finished this program since 1977 are either division directors like myself or department chairs or um, cancer center directors. Some work um, in the National Institutes of Health. We have people in the military doing great work um, as well as people in industry developing new molecules to treat our patients. Next slide. And so there you have it. We've completed the wheel, the oncology wheel. Uh, from the discipline to community prevention, surgical innovation, the national voice, translational science, global health, clinical trials, and medical education. And I'm going to leave you with a little video of a patient that's given us permission to share her story. And um, this was a terrible, um, very frightening situation. This was a pregnant woman who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer while she was pregnant. She had to undergo chemotherapy while she was pregnancy monitoring the baby to make sure the baby didn't get affected by the chemotherapy because the chemotherapy does cross, cross the placenta. She had her baby delivered and then she had to have a very extensive operation, more chemotherapy. Uh, she developed COVID. Um, anyways, we can go to the next slide and play that video if there's time. Oh, before I move to that, um, you can see as we're um, Worldwide, we, we've got a national presence, uh, international presence. For example, for expertise in gynecologic cancers, I'm ranked number 13 globally in terms of expertise for this. And through philanthropy and grants, we brought in um, millions and millions of dollars to UC Irvine. Next slide. And this is the um, video I was going to share if there is time. Now at 4.30, meet a health go. crisis survivor. She's beating cancer, and now she's beating the odds over COVID-19. Bernadette Hernandez is a fighter as well as a new mother. Yeah, while 2020 has been a challenge for most of us, it's been especially challenging for her. KKL 9 Orange County reporter Michelle Geely spoke with her. Hello. Hey there. Today is the first time UC Irvine oncologist Krish Tiwari had a chance to meet nine-month-old Ariana. The Yorba Linda girl will one day learn about all her mother went through during pregnancy. A cancer diagnosis, the necessity for chemo, surgery, and then chemo again. And to top it off, Bernadette Hernandez recently recovered from COVID. There is so much to celebrate after an extremely difficult year. It's a real problem with cancer and pregnancy because there's so many issues. There's issues regarding the baby, issues with the mother's health, the timing of delivery, uh, the route of delivery. It's, um, it was very difficult. And ovarian cancer itself is a big problem. It requires really um, very complicated chemotherapy and very complex surgery. It's no wonder Ariana was given the middle name Angel. She's my angel, Bernadette told me. 
Chemotherapy is rare for pregnant women, yet the baby suffered no negative health effects. Normally, ovarian cancer surgery is done before chemo, but Dr. Tawari says had it been done first, the patient would have lost her child. It's definitely been a challenging year. I've just stayed strong. There are times where, you know, it gets very tough and I have to just remind myself, you know, don't give up, keep keep fighting, stay strong, get through this. 31-year-old Bernadette Hernandez, who is a fitness coach, stayed strong physically and mentally during her last rounds of chemo, training for a bodybuilding competition. Two months ago today, she won five medals in the SoCal Classic, first place in women's athletic and scored in the top three in the bikini competition. And the best news of all is her cancer is in remission. In your Belinda, Michelle Geely, KCAL 9 News. Wow, what an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Dr. Tawari. Uh, we do have some questions um, from audience members um, that I'll share now. Um, so this first one, um, I think is for Dr. Consal. Dr. Consal, you had mentioned chemovention drugs. Are there a lot of side effects to taking those drugs? Thank you. Um, first of all, I just have to comment on that video and what a fantastic story. I mean, who, who looks yeah. like that after a baby and surgery <laughs> like that, but um, it's amazing. And I think it speaks a lot to the way that um, coming to a place that has all of those spokes of the wheel so well defined um, can make a huge difference because we have to think out of the box at times and COVID taught us that we can do a lot of things differently than we probably were not doing in the past. And so I love this and it's fun to hear the talk with ovarian cancers and other gynecologic cancers, because so many things overlap, of course, with breasts. So many of the drugs that are used um, for gynecologic cancers, we are also using in breast and seeing amazing um, outcomes in our clinical trials and with our patients. So um, having these lectures together go hand in hand, it's just really wonderful to see. Um, in terms of the chemo prevention drugs, thank you for asking that question. Um, there are and can be some side effects. You can imagine estrogen in our body is something that um, is there for a reason. So when we block it, a lot of times the side effects are similar to what patients feel when they are going through menopause. So mm -hmm. we can have hot flashes, joint achiness, some other things. I will be honest, the vast majority of patients take it. And once they are within about a three month period, many do just fine. And it's almost like taking a vitamin, but the fear of the side effects is what does keep some people away from starting them. Thank you. And I do see, I think Dr. Tuari is responding in um, the Q&A to some of these questions, but for the good of the group, um, yeah. I'll ask, is your cervical cancer trial still open? Yeah. So the, I, I, you know, I kind of was rushing, but the, the um, study, the, the medicine that is studying um, in what we call an antibody drug conjugate, uh, we have that trial open at UC Irvine, and we are studying that um, in women with very advanced cervical cancer. Um, in addition to that, we have some surgical um, studies in for earlier stage cervical cancer that are open at UC Irvine. The studies that I showed you, the publications of those have been completed um, and they're published, but we are monitoring the patients on those studies still, even though the studies are done, they're still being monitored for survival. Thank you very much. Um, I think this one for Dr. Consal. Uh, what is the difference between a 2D and 3D mammogram, especially for dense breasts? Sure, this is a question we get all the time. Um, a 2D mammogram is our typical screening mammogram that we've had for decades. It takes an X-ray in one compression view and then an X-ray in the other compression view. So our radiologist and we can look at those images and see if there's a difference in the breast compared to years gone by. Dense breast tissue is a little bit harder to find things in because that dense tissue looks more white and cancers and concerning things can look white. And therefore patients who have less dense breast tissue, we can find those cancers a little bit easier. They sort of pop out. So in the patients who have dense tissue, something that is becoming standard of care is to do 3D mammogram, also called tomosynthesis because it allows the radiologist to almost have multiple mammograms throughout the tissue and they can scan through, more like someone may think about a CT scan or an MRI, they can go through the tissue and therefore get more of a 3D picture of the breast. 
Um, most places now are only doing 3D mammograms compared to 2D mammograms. It's really becoming standard of care. And the only other thing I would touch on with that is that there is some current concern about the radiation exposure at the time of mammography. Some patients do not want a mammogram and go other, op other routes such as um, thermography or some other ways to look at the breast tissue. Um, I just would like to always tell patients and everyone on this call that uh, the amount of radiation that you receive from a mammogram is less than you would receive from going in an airplane flight from California to New York or living at altitude in Colorado for one day. So it's, re it's a very safe amount and the same with 3D mammograms. Um, and it has never been shown through many, many, many studies to cause breast cancer. Thank you. And the next question, are there any clinical trials for a very aggressive and rare large cell ovarian cancer? Yeah, the, you know, the, um, the, one of the biggest challenges is in oncology are designing clinical trials for rare tumors. Um, I do not know of a um, clinical trial specifically for large cell ovarian cancer. I, I'm not sure, I'm not even familiar with that term. There is such a thing as small cell ovarian cancer. The gynecologic oncology group, which is um, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, does have a, what we call a rare tumor working group. And they do design trials for some of the more or the less common cancers. Um, and so what I would recommend doing is going to clinicaltrials.gov, G O V is in government, and putting in the keywords ovarian cancer and large cell and see if um, there is a trial for that. Again, I'm not familiar with that term, so I'm not sure if that term is correct, but um, yeah, I think um, the best bet is to look on that website. And that website gives you all the trials that are open and registered with the FDA, not just trials from the National Cancer Institute. Thank you. Next question, how much radiation is there with a breast MRI? This one is an easy one. There is no radiation at all with breast MRI. It's based on um, magnets and it's very interesting, but there's no radiation, so no risk. This is in difference to a CT scan, which can have radiation. Um, same with an ultrasound. The other imaging modality we use for the breast, there's no radiation associated with that as well. I always tell patients they can have as many MRIs and ultrasounds as they want. You know, there's no ionizing radiation. Um, Thank you. Um, and next question, is MRI best for dense breast tissue? So MRI is very sensitive. It looks at the breast in a very different way than a mammogram does or an ultrasound. Um, it really is looking more at blood flow as well. It is a contrast enhanced study in the breast. Um, and so it is a very good way to image dense tissue. But that being said, a screening mammogram and the 3D mammogram specifically is still a better screening test than a breast MRI is. But we sometimes do add in an ultrasound or add in a breast MRI if the tissue is very dense. So there's any concern for finding something within the, um, within the breast. And I see the other question between an ultrasound and a 3D mammogram. The way that it looks at the tissue is just is very, very different. Ultrasounds are best to look at tissue when we have a site of concern. So if we have a palpable mass or there's an area that we see on a mammogram and we wanna target that area with the ultrasound, it looks through the tissue very differently while a mammogram is an X-ray of the entire breast and therefore a better screening tool. Thank you so much. Well, I do think we will um, wrap up our Q&A session and I just want to thank Dr. Tawari and Dr. Kinsel, so much for your time today and your very, very informative presentations. Thanks so much for having us. It's an honor to present with Dr. Kinsel. <laughs> I'd say the same for you. This is always a fun talk. So thank you for having us. Well, thank you. So in closing um, of today's Anti-Cancer Challenge webinar, if you haven't yet already, we do invite you to join the 2022 UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge which is an annual peer-to-peer -peer fundraising event where participants sign up to ride, run, walk, or volunteer and raise money and awareness for cancer research. We work with corporate partners to underwrite the cost of the event. So 100% of proceeds go directly to cancer research. 
The first three years we held the Anti-Cancer Challenge were in person in the last two years virtually, and we've had 9,300 participants sign up since 2017, raise more than $2.6 million for research. We're also consistently recognized as a top five fundraising event in the Orange County Business Journal. Next slide, please. So we're very excited to announce that the sixth annual UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge will take place on Saturday, October 8th in UCI's Aldrich Park. It will be a hybrid event with opportunities to participate both in person and virtually. In-person challenge day will include a 5K, 10K run walk, a 14, 35, 60, and 100 mile bike routes, entertainment, a family friendly festival and awards. And we are continuing on with our monthly educational webinar series featuring renowned faculty like those who presented today. Next slide. So we do hope that you'll consider starting, joining, or supporting a team. All proceeds support promising pilot studies and early phase clinical trials that can help prevent, treat, and cure cancers. Next slide. And please do join us for a webinar next month on cancer and genetics on Thursday, July 28th from 1 to 2 p.m. Next slide. And if you would like to sign up to receive webinar reminders in Anti-Cancer Challenge news, please scan the QR code on the screen or visit the website listed. So thank you again so much and have a wonderful rest of the day.